Amen. The central part of the message today, we can't, we can't uh, not face this, is what we know as the Lord's Prayer. However, I always try to say something about the other two lessons. I, if, if I don't, why did we listen to them at all? So I've got to say something about them. Hosea, like Amos, who we heard last week, like Amos, is another 8th century prophet in the northern, oh, now here, this is going to be on the test, in the northern kingdom of Israel, I over J, good. The northern kingdom of Israel, probably a little later than the prophet we heard last week, who's Amos. Probably, most importantly, God, or the prophet, is not condoning prostitution. How many times have you been sort of meditating on what's happening on a nice Sunday at the end of July, and, and the lecturer gets up and, and uses the word whore three times. You get sort of whiplash. And you go, what did she say? What, what did she say? Um, no. So when the prophet says, find a whore and marry her, or whatever, however it's phrased. Now this is, this is a question from your English class. When, they, when the prophet says, find a whore and marry her, what kind of writing is that? Huh? No, it, 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 I mean, it is imperative in what it's saying, but it's a kind of statement. It starts with an M. Metaphor. Metaphor. The story of Hosea and his family, which we start with right away in Hosea chapter 1, is a metaphor for God and the people of the northern kingdom of Israel. So if Hosea is to marry a whore, that's, that's harder language than saying marry a prostitute, isn't it? It's just harder to hear that word said in church. If, if he's told to marry a whore, what, what the people are saying, he's talking about God and us. And then we have metaphorical children. We have the oldest son whose name is Jezreel, and if you've ever been to the Holy Land, you know that Je the Jezreel Valley is a valley uh, in, in the northern kingdom of Israel where major battles were fought. And then we have uh, Lo Ruhama and Lo Ami, I think it is, the, the uh, two other children. And children in, in the Old Testament are often named for the situation into which they are born. And this metaphorical oldest daughter's name is no mercy, for I will not have mercy on, on God says, on, on my people. And then the third child is, I am, uh, what was it, Lo Ami, I am, you are nobody, you are no one. It's talking about the people, pardon me, just knocked, knocked our sound technician off his chair. Um, uh, so the children are talking, of, are, are, uh, relate to the, the situation between Israel and their God. And interestingly enough, in verse 11, which we did not hear in today's reading, but the verse that comes right after what uh, was read, says, it tells, of a, a, uh, it tells of a reunited kingdom with Judah and a glorious, joyous day. So there is good news at the end of the story. We just didn't get it in today's reading. The second reading from Colossians continues the general themes that, that were begun last week. And the central verse, the central point of this reading, verse 9 says, everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear him clearly. Or in the message it says, all the fullness of deity, all the fullness of God lives in Christ's body. You see Jesus, you see the deity of God. 
We also can tell, now this is, now put on your thinking caps for a moment about St. Paul and some of the things that he would talk to us about in some of his epistles. We know that this was not written directly by Paul because of the language, the complementary language about what subject. Starts with a C. Circumcision. Paul was opposed to the converts to followers of Jesus to go back and follow the Jewish law of circumcision or the Jewish law of kosher. Don't do that. That's the old life. The new life is in Christ. And yet the language in today's lesson is complementary about, it uses complementary terms about circumcision. And my, my guess would be that the follower of Paul, in whose name Colossians was being written, was trying to sort of rehabilitate that term so people wouldn't feel quite so negative about it. Um, but definitely not be written by, Paul got so upset, I think it was in Galatians, Paul got so upset about the fact that the Judaizers, as he called them, were coming back and trying to circumcise people that he says, when you have that knife in your hand, I hope you slip and do it to yourself. Not a nice thought. Okay, I went over that awfully quickly, but it's all important and it will be on the test. Luke chapter 11. If we're driving around the, the gospel, this is the biggest speed bump to come to and slow down and think about. It's what we call the Lord's Prayer. For 35 years, uh, I taught I taught uh, clergy and therapists how to use a premarital and relationship inventory known as PREPARE. Some of you have taken that. I know because I taught Father Neil how to use it. So I know that, that people who have been married here have, have had to take PREPARE. Um, and because I was teaching Christians and Jews and secular folks, I would often in break time talk with people of many traditions about how we did weddings. Now amongst the Christians, many in the classes were evangelicals from a myriad of groups, many of which whom we might call fundamentalist congregations. I remember one day mentioning the place of the Lord's Prayer in our marriage service. Um, and someone, somebody looked perplexed and said, you use that in a marriage service? I said, yeah. And then so other people would say, what's the Lord's Prayer? What's the Lord's? I was shocked. That was so central. If you're part of liturgical church in Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterians on their good days, um, and other groups, you, you, you know what the Lord's Prayer is, you say it. In fact, as I mentioned before, in colonial America during the, using the six, uh, 1662 prayer book, or this, our first prayer book, the 1789 prayer book, and some of you came up here last week and looked at that, uh, on a normal Sunday, if you were going through a full service of morning prayer, litany, sermon, and, and communion, you would say the Lord's Prayer four or five times, and the, con and the, uh, the uh, Congregationalists of the time, the, uh, I'm looking for the other word to call them, um, they, uh, they, th that's what they called vain repetitions. Why are you saying that again and again and again and again? Um, now we use it a great deal. We say it with morning prayer and evening prayer and a noonday prayer, and at Compline, and at weddings, and at funerals, and at ordinations, and at really at any communion, service of Holy Communion. We have two forms of the Lord's Prayer, the traditional language, our Father who art in heaven, and the contemporary language, our Father in heaven. Uh, I'm actually more used to the um, uh, modern translation because I went to St. Bede's where I was the rector for 31 years, and somebody sitting anonymously over there was on the search committee. Um, I said, so which, which translation do you use here? And, and uh, 
somebody said, well, well, if we're doing right two, we use the, the contemporary language, and if we're doing right one, we use the traditional language. And I said, okay, and that's what we did. Um, one of my professors in seminary said that the traditional words were more like Matthew's gospel and the contemporary more like Luke's gospel. You may have noticed that what is in today's gospel sounds different. Let me read it to you out of the message. Translate, again, that, that translation, just so you can see, see how bare bones it is. Father, reveal who you are, set the world right, keep us alive with three square meals, keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others, keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Sounds a little different, doesn't it? There are a number of translations, some of the Greek in the Lord's Prayer uh, is very hard to translate. One of the phrases that has been argued about by theologians for the last hundred years that has been, uh, they've been uh, putting it into the vernacular is lead us not into temptation. Save it, keep us from the time of trial, save us from the evil one. I'm just not quite sure how to translate that term. Last year at my retirement, a valued colleague of mine, Father Jim Prendergast from uh, St. Mark's in, in um, from St. Mark's. Thank you, Altadena. I knew this wasn't St. Mark's Van Nuys and my brain just stopped at that point. Uh, gave me a, a little book, a copy of this book, it's called The Our Father, A New Reading by a Roman Catholic scholar named Gerhard Lofink. I'll leave this up here if you want to come down and write this down afterwards. And I always look for books, I always, as, uh, when I was at St. Bede's, I always looked for books that were short, that were accessible, and that I could use with a group for adult study. And this is one of them, but I, he gave it to me when I retired, so I didn't have a group to study with. You're getting a little bit of my lesson plan today. So it's a short book. It's only 112 pages, and they're, short, and they're small pages. They're not very big pages. So I'm just going to read some quotes from this book. The Our Father is primarily a prayer for disciples. Every line is about disciples forgetting their own desires and plans for their lives and desiring only what God wills. I'm going to say that again because that's such an important line. Every line is about disciples forgetting their own desires and plans for their lives and desiring only what God wills. In that sense, it is a dangerous prayer. It is a dangerous prayer for anyone who prays it. For us, the Our Father has often become routine. It's worn out. Its words and phrases are as blurred as a foggy landscape. Hallowed be your name. Your will be done. It has all become vague. It's interesting to note that the, and this is very obvious in the translation I read for you, the uh, uh, original Our Father was nothing but petitions. Reveal who you are, set the world right, keep us alive, it's just petitions to God. I also find it interesting that at the beginning of today's gospel, it says, one day when Jesus was playing, praying, playing, was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of the disciples said, Master, teach us to pray. Now, if you were following a rabbi and he was reading Psalms, you were praying almost all of the time. You were praying almost all the time. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So this is a continuity from John the Baptist. It's a very intimate prayer. Nothing 
uh, of the kind in our Father Abba is the only address. It's not, it's not all um, full of flowery language about God. Abba, it is familial. The communicative situation of the, of the Our Father is not that of a king's court ceremonial, but of family intimacy. Abba was, well, I've often said it's like saying daddy, but I'll say gracious, gracious father, gracious, loving father. It is, it, it's, it's something you would say to someone intimately, not way up there. More precisely, that is Jesus's new family. The Our Father is clearly divided into two parts. The first part talks about God. Reveal who you are, set the world right, and then the, the final petitions, keep us alive with three square meals, daily bread, keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others, keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. In Luke, the fifth petition of the Our Father reads, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves, for, for, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Matthew's translation reads, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. I liked that prayer when I was young because I loved to have my debts forgiven, especially when the bills would come in from my newly acquired credit cards. Forgive, forgive, oh Lord, forgive my debts. That's not what he's talking about. It's what, forgive what we owe God for what we have done. Forgive us our trespasses. However you want to say it. Trespasses are better, I think, than debts. The whole chapter shows that forgiveness is part of the life breath of the community of disciples. There must be unconditional love pardon me, unconditional forgiveness at all times and everywhere, if only because God also continually forgives. I would note when Jesus was in, in, in John chapter 20, when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, and he, this is, this is for John's gospel, this is Pentecost. He breathes on his disciples. He breathes on his disciples. And he gives them one job description. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The disciples have one job description, forgiveness. Other gospels give them more, but, but, but John focuses on forgiveness. If the social relationships within the people of God are out of line, the glory of the temple and the beauty of its liturgical worship are nothing but a farce. You can't cover up false piety or meaningless words with fancy ceremonial. It needs to be dealing with our heart. And as, my, as Bishop Bob Anderson, who I think some of you remember, used to say, a person is whole and healed when their insides and outsides touch. A person is whole and healed when their insides and outsides touch. Well, maybe we should simply say the Lord's Prayer with long silences between each petition. Father Lofink begins his meditation with this paraphrase of our Father. Some of you have, have come across the New Zealand prayer book. I know it's in the sacristy, so I know you've seen it. And the Lord's Prayer in there is a paraphrase, uh, and some people like that very much. Father Lofink has his paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. It reads, Father in heaven, we are your disciples, your community, your church. Together with Jesus and listening to his words, we are permitted to speak to you as our Father. Abba, dear Father. Gather your scattered and strife-torn people, 
Make it to be the true people of God so that your name may be honored before all the world. Give us the strength to gather a community in your name to bring it together and make it one. Hallowed be your name. Let your reign, your rule, come into the world. Be our only master. We no longer want to serve our self-made gods. Give us the strength to live as truly human as your people without violence or hatred in your peace. Your kingdom come. Bring your plan to completion, the plan for the world you have conceived from all eternity. Let it come from heaven to earth, from your heart to ours. Give us the strength together with our communities to be your aid, your sacrament for the world. Your will be done. Because you are our dear Father, give us today as much of the essentials as necessary for the day to come. Let our first concern be for your reign and let it be more important to us than everything else. Let us be so filled with the need to bear witness to it that we have no time at all to plan and constantly to think only of ourselves. Give us the strength in all of this to help one another and provide for one another. Give us today the bread we need. We can never repay all the debts we have incurred before you and to which we continually add. We always fall short in love. Therefore, forgive us all our indebtedness, all our guilt. And we know that we dare not utter such a prayer unless we also forgive our brothers and sisters all their debts to us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is because your reign is to, is to break our miserable history, pardon me, it is because your reign is to break into our miserable history that we are so threatened by temptation, the temptation to fall away, to surrender our discipleship, to doubt your church, and no longer believe in your plan for the world. Do not lead us into a situation in which this great temptation will overcome us. Let us not fall victim to it, but deliver us from the deadly power of evil. Father Lofink says, any time you have a paraphrase, and he says about his, it doesn't replace the Our Father because the Our Father says it more concisely and more clearly. We should pray the Our Father every day as Jesus taught it, and the church has handed it down to us. Pray it slowly, thoughtfully, and, and reverently. We should protect it like a costly treasure. It, is not on, it, on, it not only leads us to the center of our Christian existence, it also shows us who Jesus really was because it draws us into the center of his heart. In a few moments, we will say the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to slow it down a little bit so we think about it as we say it. If you want to come up here afterwards and copy down the title or see the book, it, I will leave, as I did last, year, last week with the books I brought, please come up. Amen. <laughs> 